Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. I pray that this day is a blessing for you and that this day is a day which will, at the end, you will look back and say, I encountered Jesus today. I pray that's the case for you and I pray that's the case for me. I want to share with you briefly uh, probably my most memorable Vespers service. First of all, what is a Vespers? Uh, a Vespers, in the Adventist world anyway, is a program, uh, a, a coming together, a time of fellowship, either to uh, usher in the Sabbath or to close the Sabbath together. This was one of the closing Sabbaths. It was a Saturday night. Um, it was in 2007. I was serving as an elder at the church, and um, the pastor gave a little devotional on celebration. And after the service, we're in the sanctuary, adjacent to the sanctuary is a fellowship room. After the service, we're going to have some munchies. And so we had closing prayer, and we're all about to go to the fellowship room. And then Tony sat down next to me, kind of pretty close, and I said, what's, this, what's going on here? And Tony was starting to talk to me uh, about different things. I wasn't sure what it was about. Uh, and then finally, about five minutes later, someone comes out into the sanctuary and says, hey, we're all ready, come on. And so we all go to the fellowship room. And then, voila, surprise, everybody says. It was conducted by my girlfriend at the time. Her name is Sherry. You might know her. She is now my beautiful wife and my daughter, Tricia. It was conducted by them. They were putting on a surprise birthday party all along. Uh, my siblings were there. Some of my siblings, my foster parents were there. And when I saw this and when I realized what was going on, I started getting choked up. I turned around, held in my tears, and then turned back around again. That was probably my most memorial, memorable uh, worship service. Well, today I want to talk to you about something the Gospels speak of. The Gospels speak of an incredible Vesper service, one which uh, is much greater than what I went through, one which was conducted by Jesus himself, one which shows us, one which reveals to us the goodness and the love and the grace of God, one in which we learn of the compassion of the Savior, one in which heaven came down and touched this sin-sick world. This was a Vespers of grace and glory. Let's turn our Bibles to the Gospel of Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, as you know, we are going on a journey with Jesus. Uh, we have uh, we've been going through the life of Christ, bringing the four Gospels together, uh, going through the life of Christ chronologically. He has set up Capernaum as his headquarters during this uh, time of ministry in the region of Galilee. Uh, we are looking at a Sabbath day. Earlier on this Sabbath, you may remember, he cast out a demon in the synagogue that morning. Uh, and then after doing that, he went over to Peter's house and healed Peter's mother-in-law of her fever. Well, the news of these events spread all around Capernaum, in fact, all around Galilee. Mark chapter 1, verse 25 says, And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. So the people were taking this time after hearing about the demoniac being healed, and some heard about Peter's mother-in-law being healed as well, People were getting ready to bring their loved ones who were sick, who were possessed, who were tormented at that time to Jesus. They didn't go right away. Why is that? Because there is this idea regarding the Sabbath day. Notice Luke chapter 13, verse 14. In another incident, the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath. And so the people in Capernaum knew the rule, no healing, no type of work like that on the Sabbath. And so they did not go to Jesus right away at Peter and Andrew's house. They waited until the sun was set. Let's look at that. Uh, Mark chapter 1 and verses 32 through 34. Mark chapter 1 verses 32 through 34. This account is found in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke. Uh, we're going to be looking at Mark's version mainly. At evening, when the sun had set, you see they had this twisted idea uh, that the Sabbath was all rules, all regulations, no type of healing, no type of ministries would take place on that day. 
at evening when the sun was set, they brought to him, that is, they brought to Jesus, all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases. I want to draw some really precious lessons from this account, from this Vesper service, from this Sabbath closing session. I want to draw some precious lessons as we look upon Jesus. And one of the things I want to bring out first and foremost is the importance of one-on-one -on -one ministry. You might say, wait a minute, Pastor, we're talking about many people coming here to Jesus. He has a crowd he's, he's ministering to. Yes, but what happened initially to trigger this? You remember the account of the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus speaks to her. She's converted. She's, she, her heart is stirred. She knows that this is the Christ. She knows that this is the Savior of the world. She goes back to her city, Sychar, where she has a bad reputation, and many come out as a result of that. Well, same thing here. Jesus ministers to one man, the demoniac in the synagogue. Word spreads throughout Capernaum, and as a result... Many are brought to Christ. Let me ask you a question. Do you know who Edward Kimball is? Well, you might say, hey, I, I never heard of this man. Who is, who is Edward Kimball? Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher in the 1800s, and he had a passion for his students, every one of them. And he sought to give all of them one-on-one uh, -on -one time with him that he might lead them to make a decision for Christ. Well, one of them was a young man who worked at a bookshop. And one day, Edward came to talk with this young man, uh, sat down with him, and shared with him the gospel, and this young man gave his life to Christ. Who was this young man? This young man was the greatest evangelist of the 19th century, Dwight L. Moody. Dwight L. Moody went out to share the gospel with others. Dwight L. Moody went out uh, and brought and, and did a whole bunch of tent meetings, a whole bunch of evangelistic series. And one man that was one to the gospel through a result of his uh, his, his, his yeah, excuse me, his efforts uh, was Chapman, J. Wilbur Chapman. J. Wilbur Chapman, he became an evangelist, and he began going out sharing the gospels throughout the nation. Uh, and one person on his team that joined him and as well became an evangelist took over when J. Wilbur Chapman retired. And who was that man? That man was Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday became a great evangelist during the turn of the century, and he began sharing the gospel with so many others. One man who was stirred by his message and gave his life to Christ was a man named Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham as well became an evangelist and began preaching the gospel throughout the nation as well. And one day, a 16-year-old teenager came to one of Mordecai's sessions, one that came to one of his series. And night after night, this young man came to listen to Mordecai. And Mordecai seemed to be looking directly at this 16-year-old and speaking to him of the urgency of giving his life to Christ. Who was this 16-year-old? This 16-year-old was Billy Graham. What does this tell you? What does this tell me? Billy Graham was probably the greatest evangelist of the 20th century. How did he become an evangelist? Because this first man, uh, this Edward Kimball, took one-on-one -on -one session with Dwight L. Moody, and the line went down the road to Billy Graham. And I remember as a kid being with some of my relatives, listening to those Billy Graham sessions, and he was a man very much looked up to in my family. So, do not despise the day of small beginnings. If God gives you the opportunity to minister to one person, take that opportunity. Pour out God, ask God to pour out His Spirit upon you that you may share Christ with that individual. You have no idea where this is going to go. Only in eternity will we see the full fruit of our efforts. Do that one-on-one -on -one working. This this Vesper service, this Vespers of grace and of glory, shows us the importance of doing the one-on-one -on -one work, but it also shows us 
our part in salvation, our part in obtaining, obtaining the grace and the healing of God. Just this last week, Sherry and I were back in Connecticut, and as I drove along Interstate 95, I saw an old familiar scene, these food trucks parked off of Long Wharf Theater Drive, which, was, which borders right on the beach of Long Island Sound. They are there year after year. Uh, those who tend to them drive them from wherever they come from, and if you're on I-95, you take that exit and you go and buy different things from that truck. So in other words, they take the long trip to get to the beach, you take the short trip when you're on I-95 to go buy that food. This is an analogy uh, for us. This gives us an idea of what happened on that night in Capernaum. Jesus took the long trip. The Word was made flesh. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word was made flesh. Jesus came from heaven to dwell here in our midst, to be among us, that he might minister to us. Jesus went from town to town to minister to different people, but he did not go door to door. If you heard that Jesus was in town and you knew that you had a need that only he can address, it was then up to you to go to where he was in that city, in that town, and pursue his grace, pursue his power, pursue his healing, pursue the salvation that he came to give. Jesus takes the long trip. Jesus take the, takes the trip that we cannot take. But if we want that salvation, we must pursue it. We must take the short trip. This was a Vespers of grace and glory. It shows us the importance of one-on-one -on -one ministry. It shows us our part of salvation. And it shows us how deeply entwined healing and forgiveness is in the scriptures. Now to understand this, I want to uh, just take a moment to take a look at the perverted and twisted view that the Jews had on sickness and on disease. The common view was, just as Job's friends had this common view, that if you were sick, if you were diseased, then God is in some way punishing you. That is a sign of God's condemnation. So notice in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, this is a separate event. Now Jesus, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Notice the mindset behind that question. If this man is blind, God struck him for one reason or another. And since he was born blind, he was either punishing the parents or he was punishing this child. And this is, uh, this is later brought out again in this same account uh, where the uh, ruler of the synagogue talks to this blind man after he had been healed and says, you were completely born in sins. Now, I want to make clear that there is a definite connection between sin and disease. There is a definite connection between sin and our mortality. In fact, Paul makes this very clear in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. He says, therefore, just as through one man, that is through Adam, sin entered into the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men. So there is a connection, a clear connection between death and disease, but it is not always direct. It is not something that we can say, hey, look, this person is diseased. God is punishing this person. That mindset that this person was born blind because of their sins, this person is possessed because of their sins, this person has this sickness, uh, is deaf or is mute, because of their sins. This person is crippled or has a bad leg because God is punishing them. This mindset leads to great discouragement because if I have this disease throughout my life and I go to the grave with this disease, then I go to the grave with a stigma. I go to the grave with this idea that God 
has rejected me and that I have no hope whatsoever. I go to the grave condemned. But the Bible makes very clear that that is not always the case. And the Bible makes very clear that there is a precious connection between healing and forgiveness. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, God promises, I will hear from heaven and will what? Forgive their sin and will what? Heal their land. Psalm 103, verse 3, speaking of God, it says he's one who forgives all your iniquities and who what? Heals all all your diseases. Notice the close connection between forgiveness and between healing. Though we cannot assume that, that disease is the direct result of my sin, my disease is the direct result of my sin, yet nonetheless, healing represents forgiveness. Healing represents forgiveness. James 5 verse 15, and the prayer of faith will save the who? Will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be what? He will be forgiven. From the book Counsels to Parents, Teachers and Students, we read, deliverance from sin and the healing of disease were linked together. So on this night, on this vespers, of grace and glory. Jesus was given to the people a clear message. Now, read verse 34 again. Mark chapter 1, verse 34. It says, Then he healed who? It says he healed many that were sick. Now, I want to make something very clear. This does not suggest that only a certain group of those who came to the door were healed. When Mark says many, he's talking about the number of people he came who came to the door. He is not suggested suggesting that they were a fraction of the people who came. Look at Luke's version of this account. Luke chapter 4 verse 40, he laid hands on who? Every one of them and did what? He healed them. So please note, everyone who came to the door that day with, the being, with being oppressed, with being possessed by a demon. Everyone who came to the door that day with some type of sickness, every one of them, Jesus healed. And he was giving to them a very specific message. You have been taught that your disease is a result or is a sign of God's condemnation. Jesus says, no, God accepts you. God loves you. God extends his grace to you. God forgives you by touching those people, by healing those people. Jesus was saying something very important. You have hope. You have salvation. You have light. You have a door open to you, to the kingdom of heaven. God has not rejected you. God has not put you away. God has not cast you away. This healing hand shows you the love, the grace, the mercy, and the compassion of the Savior. This incident teaches us something very important as well. Such an example for us. I pointed out already that these people had a twisted view regarding the Sabbath. These people had a twisted idea in regard to the Sabbath. But Jesus still ministered to them. Maybe God brings people into your life that don't see the Word of God as you see it, that don't have the better understanding that you might have. You might look down on them. You might disdain them. You might see them as unworthy of your time and of your effort. My friend, let it not be so. Jesus ministered to those who did not understand the purpose of the Sabbath. Let us minister to such as well. Notice from the book, Ministry of Healing, page 20, the Savior made each work of healing an occasion for implanting divine principles in the mind and soul. This was the purpose of his work. He imparted earthly blessings that he might incline the hearts of men to receive the gospel of his grace. At that door, on that night, at that door, 
on, at that time together, Jesus was telling the people of, that they have hope. Jesus was telling the people that a door of salvation is open to them. Jesus was telling the people, you are not under the condemnation of the Father. The Father has sent me to heal you. The Father has sent me to save you. The Father has sent me to proclaim to you the gospel of his grace. That was a Vespers. That was a Vespers of grace and of glory. I love what Matthew uh, tells us in his version of this account. Notice Matthew chapter 8 and verse 17. He says, Jesus carried these things out that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Let's dwell on this for a moment. Jesus himself bore our diseases. He bore our sicknesses. What does that mean? It's not saying that when Jesus touched that leper or when Jesus touched that mute, he himself became leprous or he himself became mute. That's not what it's saying. He was not contaminated in his touching of those who were diseased. He did not become possessed when he cast out the demons from those who were possessed. That's not what it's saying here. Matthew quotes from Isaiah 53. You are familiar with that chapter, I'm sure. Isaiah 53 depicts the suffering servant of God, a precious picture of the ministry of the Messiah, the Christ who is to come. And while Isaiah 53 is very largely looked at by us as one that speaks of the atonement that Christ came to give, Matthew points out that it is more than that. He came to bring us healing as well. Notice how this passage in Isaiah that Matthew quoted is given to us from the Jewish Publication Society, from the Masoretic Text. Isaiah 53 verse 3 says, He was a man of what? Pains and acquainted with what? Disease. How was he acquainted with these things? How did he come to know them? How did he get so familiar with them? Surely our diseases he did bear and our pains he carried. How was Jesus familiar with these things? How did Jesus become acquainted with these things? Because he entered into our experience with us. To understand what this experience was like for Jesus, let me speak of a nurse who works at a nursing home and regularly has to deal with some of the sick residents there, regularly cleaning up their vomit, regularly wiping off the pus from an infection they may have, regularly changing the very soiled sheets that they slept in the night before. She does these things perhaps out of a sense of duty. But if she goes home and one of the children that she loves is going through some of the same things, is regurgitating or has an infected cut or is soiling the sheets, she would do these very things and she would do them out of love. Are these things repulsive? Yes, they're repulsive. Do you like looking at these things? Do you like handling these things? No, not at all. And in the same way, when Jesus came into the presence of and entered to contact with sin, it was repulsive to him. He was a man that was pure of heart. He was a man who followed only, solely, and fully the will of God. He gave no consideration whatsoever to the temptations that came upon him. To be in the presence of sin was a loathsome experience for him, but the love of Christ, the love of Christ was greater than that repulsion. The love of Christ was greater than that disgust. Not only at the cross, did Jesus suffer for our sins? Not only at the cross did he bear the weight that we placed upon him. Please notice what we are told in the book of Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, in all their affliction, he was what? He was afflicted. 
When we are pained, Jesus is pained. When we are suffering, Jesus suffers with us. When we are hurt, Jesus knows that hurt and bears that with us. Notice as well in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, the King James Version tells us, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our what? Our infirmities, our weaknesses, our diseases. Jesus knows what we are going through. Jesus enters into that experience with us. Jesus comes close to us, so close to us, that what we are dealing with, what we are suffering, He takes upon Himself. Praise the Lord. It was not just at the cross that Jesus suffered, but throughout His ministry. You can get an idea now of how draining these sessions were. By the way, this is the first session we have in the Gospels on record in which we find Jesus ministering like this to the multitude, healing the multitude that came to him. Praise God, Jesus provides us an entire solution. He has saved us from the penalty of sin. He is saving us from the power of sin. And sessions such as this in the Gospels foreshadow when he will save us from the presence of sin. He knows intimately our sufferings. He knows intimately our pain. He knows intimately our sickness, our disease. He enters into that with us and he shares them with us. This was a Vespers of grace and glory. When I was a kid, one of the game shows I used to watch a lot was Let's Make a Deal with Monty Hall. You may be familiar with that. Uh, Monty Hall would call random people out of the audience and bring them up front uh, and he would give them something valuable. Maybe it was a $50 bill, $100 bill, or, or something, some, something in a box that they can't look at yet. And they became a trader, T-R-A-D-E-R. -E they, they would trade with him. And he would give them the option. You can keep what you have, or you can trade it for something behind one of these doors. Door number one, door number two, or door number three. Now, the trader did not know what was behind those doors. They are taking a risk. Should they give up that which might be valuable for what's behind that door? What's behind that door may be what they call a zonk or, or a junk piece. It may be a shirt that only an elephant can fit in or something. It may be entirely worthless, or it might be a car, or it might be a vacation, uh, tickets for a vacation. They don't know. They're taking a chance in selecting one of those doors. Well, my friends, on that night, these people knew what was at the door. On that night, these people knew what they were going to. Mark chapter 1, verse 33, the whole city was gathered together at that door. Some saw what happened in the synagogue that Sabbath morning. Some heard about it later, but all came. All came, regardless of what their disease was, regardless of what their issues were. My friend, what about you? Jesus is at the door. Jesus is calling you to become a partaker of His grace, a partaker of His salvation, a partaker of His love and of His goodness. You are not making uh, an uncertain deal here, no. You are coming to Him to trade your sin, you are coming to trade with him your sick heart, your sick imagination. He will take you. He will touch you. He will heal you. He will convert you. He will lead you into the kingdom of God. You can be certain what stands at the door if Jesus is there. Come to Jesus today. And as this was a Vespers of grace and glory, your experience with him, your connection with Him, your walk with Him, too, can be one of grace and glory. My prayer for each and every one of us is that we will do what everyone in Capernaum did that night and come to Jesus.